Hussar uniforms, or the Hussar troop type, became very popular because of the super fancy uniform, which became a status thing for all armies to have their units of Hussars. But it wasn't just influential in the troop type, the uniform itself was picked up by a lot of different units. People wanted to look just as fancy as the Hussars. Even in civilian life, the aspects of the uniform popped up there. It became very popular for uh, 19th century ladies to have even dresses named after the police, which is this jacket here. They had a particular style of um, fur-lined dress with the uh, horizontal braid going all along. It was quite, quite a weird-looking outfit, bizarre-looking uh, mutation of the Hussar uh, theme, but, you know, that's it was influential. But a whole lot of other unit types all throughout the 19th century really loved the Hussar uniform and took on aspects of it. Took on the, the Busbys, Kolpaks, Pelsmuts, whatever you want to call them, and the the braided jackets, and as I said before, the, uh, the decorations on the cross belts, the sword belt, the, uh, the saber tash, all those kind of things, they were, became highly influential throughout all the other armies. Artillery units were very well known for having, and also rocketeer units, which are popular in the British Army, were very well known for their Hussar style outfits. And they basically took the Hussar outfits whole. Also, the French artillery as well, I believe they had this a, a uniform that was influenced by the Hussar outfits. I'm not sure why, that is, why this became popular for artillery, possibly because artillery units were um, very technologically advanced, so they are up and coming, so a lot of wealthy officers gravitated towards that, very educated people. So they had a bit more influence and um, they wanted, you know, they, it, was, uh, it was something with a lot of vibrancy and a lot of things were happening. So maybe they were able to decide for themselves what kind of uniform that they wanted their uh, unit to have. So particularly, I think, the mounted artillery, which is basically... That's not artillery who had cannons on horses, that's artillery who would uh, had lighter guns and they'd uh, ride into battle towing the uh, guns behind them. Um, there were also, uh, very famously, if you've ever seen the Sharp series with Sean Bean playing a character who doesn't get killed in any of the episodes that I've ever seen of uh, Sharp's Rifles. Now he has a Hessar uniform. People say the, so he was uh, a, an officer of the 95th Rifles, and I think the, the 65th were another, I think, something 60-something um, rifles as well. They had a very similar style of uniform. Now, people say that uniform originated for those um, uh, troops of, uh, you know, the 95th Rifles because of their experience in, or well, the experience of particular officers in the United States uh, doing various things, fighting against re American rebels or whatever, and they wanted to be concealed so they wore green and all this kind of thing, and they could sneak up on people and shoot them with their nice, accurate, long-range rifles. But... I'm a bit suspicious about that because people didn't really think of camouflage in that way and concealment and and hunting. They didn't really... Not for military uniforms. It was a very different style of thinking. And the other thing is uh, Humpsbach's Hussars, which were um, a German uh, troop of Hussars, wore exactly pretty much exactly that uniform that you see um, Sean Bean wearing in that uh, in the Hus Sharps series. And they also consisted of a group of um, mounted riflemen. 
and they were active in all the same places that uh, these officers were who started out the uh, the 95th and 65th rifles or whatever they were. So it seems to be more obvious that uh, they just adopted these these riflemen from Hunspatch SSRs and also their uniforms. Maybe they had the added benefit of thinking, you know, that the uniforms are more concealable, but it seems to me it more logical that they uh, took the uniforms from them rather than inventing them whole. And that's what people normally did. It was pretty much unheard of that uniforms would just come out of the ether. People would just design them and it, it would be something that had never been seen before. It was usually a, pieces of uniforms adopted from other units and or influenced by other units and that's how that would evolve. So yeah, very, very much more likely. Uh, so yeah, the SA uniforms were very influential all throughout the 19th century. Um, especially in the early 19th century, that's where they had their heyday. They did change a lot in the latter part. Um, you notice a very specific thing about this particular uniform is the skull, the Totenkopf. Now, you'll uh, probably remember um, uh, a later version of famous uniforms. It's black and silver that has the skull symbol which is uh, Waffen SS, um, Alemannia SS, I don't know, whatever. And it, which is quite a, an unfortunate association. I would never want my uniform to be associated with that. Now there's this idiotic idea that uh, Hugo Boss, the famous designer, uh, was responsible for the look of the German uh, uniforms, which is moronic. Uh, he just had a um, uh, clothing factory who, they produced the uniforms. The, in actual fact, the famous German uniforms were based on late 19th century uniforms that the British had popularised with the wide-legged jodhpurs, um, four-pocket tunic uh, jackets, and that came over to Germany and became popular for them and was basically everybody in the First World War pretty much had that uniform. So the German uniforms by the Second World War were incredibly conservative, old-fashioned uniforms that everyone else had grown out of. It wasn't something that this Hugo Boss had designed at all. Now, the black uniforms of the, um, the SS is actually a mutated version of what the poor old um, Tottenkopf Hussars had uh had in the late 19th century. They had very wide jodhpurs, um, it was all black and silver still, and they had, uh, once they had uh, gotten rid of their nice braided jackets, they had, uh, well, the, the, more, the more simplified versions of the inner flight for parade or whatever had four pockets. Um, so, yeah, that's all they did. They just adopted a mutated version of uh, what had been an established uniform type. It was, um, yeah, pretty much a simplified version as what you'd have as uniforms developed over time. They become more simplified and ceremonial kind of aspects like the braiding and stuff like would disappear. So yeah, unfortunately that SS uniform was influenced by the Lieb Hussar uniform. Although I will say the skull is different. The German's skull, well, the SS skull that they have has this disgusting looking jaw on it. Uh, the skulls on all Lieb Hussarian uniforms never had those. They're just a, a more simplified style. And apparently the reason behind that was because this symbol was very popular with the, the army. And in order to get the army on side, the Nazis... Uh, could not have that skull as their symbol. They had to add a skull in order to appease the army. So you'll see some slightly difference in uh, the, the skulls on World War II uniforms. Some of them, some of them will have this big, goofy, dumb-looking jaw. Some of them won't. That's because the SS ones have the jaw. The, the army ones don't. They just have a funny-looking 
skull with the, the crossbones. Not a great skull like this, it a, looks almost like a mushroom, it's very simplified. Anyway, that's our rambling thing about uh, SI uniforms and how they have uh, changed and adapted.